It's Thursday the 24th of August and time for a very special Oroville update with unprecedented access to the Oroville construction site inside the spillway today. My name's Juan Brown and you're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. We've had a great time crawling all around the Oroville spillway today and I want to give a special thanks to the folks that reached out and let us in to the construction site. Why don't you come on over here for a second and say hi. Matt Murray, DWR engineer, water engineer, right? Water resources engineer. Water resources engineer. He answered a lot of technical questions. We were able to get Jeff Peterson out here. It was just a few moments of his precious time. He answered a lot of questions. Uh, Tom, what's Tom's last name? Cava Rubia. Cava? Cava Rubia. Cava Rubia. Try that. He answered a lot of great questions. And uh, from the PA office, we also had Matt Notley. Notley. Matt Notley. All came together to help us help you get the story of what's going on out here at Oroville. So let's go take a look at one of the single biggest monumental engineering projects going on in America right now today. Welcome back to part two of our Oroville Spillway Tour from Thursday the 24th of August. On the previous episode we went all the way back to the beginning February 7th when this story broke as we took a drive across the Oroville Dam and headed over to the main offices in the structural concrete plant area on the old boat ramp parking lot. Here we met the folks from DWR and Kiwit that were going to take us out on our tour and we got a lot of great background information right here in the office. Now it's time to strap on your boots, grab your hard hat, you might want to set earplugs, it's going to get loud. Let's go out and check out the rest of the structural concrete plant and the secant cutoff wall. First stop, the far end of the emergency spillway. And the spillway, all that is, has been demoed out to the So this is an extension of, of the emergency spillway, so to speak. It's considered the same structure. It's the same, same structure. structure. It was part of the emergency spillway. We're just redoing it. And it's going to raise it up how much above this parking lot? bigger and deeper so that it's got a better foundation. Was that part of the concern? Was this emergency parking lot being a problem during the no, emergency? Not the lot. Nah, not no, the this is all rock design. Yeah, and good. the flow level of the water wasn't real deep here. Yeah. In my opinion, yeah. I think it was part of it. Alright. You can see where this was excavated down. This used to be part of a hillside, so they already had to dig this down quite a bit, so they found this has got a lot of boulders under. The boat ramp parking lot is about the same elevation as the top of the emergency spillway and of course flooded when the emergency spillway began to pour over its top. Today of course the boat ramp parking lot is the PCC or structural concrete plant. So it's this orange section of the emergency spillway that DWR is improving now by building it deeper and wider. Driving back over the emergency spillway and looking back to the north, you can see the trench that they are digging to improve this section of the emergency spillway. Right along the edge of the boat ramp parking lot. Next construction season, all this concrete that was poured during the emergency will be removed and replaced with roller compacted concrete all the way from the emergency spillway down to the secant cutoff wall. So I asked where specifically was the erosion that caused the evacuation order? And it was this deep head cutting erosion more in the middle of the emergency spillway that caused the evacuation of over 180,000 people. So why did they have to use the emergency spillway in the first place? Well, when the main spillway busted, they initially had to shut it off to assess the damage. Meanwhile, unprecedented amounts of warm rainfall continued to pound the North State. After a series of tentative tests of the main spillway, operators agreed upon a flow of about 50,000 CFS for the busted main spillway, but it eventually was not enough and the emergency spillway was overtopped. The main spillway was then opened up to 100,000 CFS until the emergency was over, and then operators were able to continue to operate throughout the rest of the flood season with a severely compromised main spillway 
causing massive erosion of the main spillway into the Thermalito diversion pool and backing up the water of the diversion pool into the Hyatt power plant, threatening to flood it. Next, we get into a conversation about testing of structural concrete from the structural concrete plant. You guys do seven days or 14? What, what do you seven, do? 14, 28, 90, and a whole. So they have to meet strength specifications on the concrete. So they pour a, a controlled cylinder, a controlled size, right. and they actually crush it. That's standard concrete design. So we crush this to try to meet those seven day strengths, 14 day strengths, 28 day strengths. And how, how, what's the frequency of those tests? Like every seven days, 14 days, 28 days. But, but uh, with the material that's coming out of the plant, how much of that, how, what's the frequency on the testing of that? It's, it's well, our quality control uh, checks every truck or swamp okay. Okay. and consistency. Uh -huh. uh, they're required to test, like, uh, depending on the, the concrete, mm -hmm. they have to do like three tests, and all three tests are good, then they can only, then they are allowed to test one every 150 yards. Okay. So we're looking for consistency. Once we get consistency, then it's at 150 yards. to change anything, yeah. and then we spot check. And if we see a wet load coming out of the truck, mm -hmm. you know we may have cylinders taken from that. Mm -hmm. But we do still take temperature readings, uh, moisture wow. content, uh, salt readings on every truck that's Okay, great. Next, Tom points out some of the other features of the structural concrete plant. Fly ash, uh, fly loads up on top. They're sent down and they're weighed. It's all computer generated. Uh, all your all your aggregates are put on a, a, a weighted conveyor scale, mm -hmm. and so all your aggregates are weighed going into the hopper. Everything gets put, pushed in, mixed, dropped into your to your uh, cement truck, and it's ready to go. Now, if the concrete is too hot. And this is a nitrogen tank there, and they inject nitrogen into the tank, okay. and it'll drop at like 10 degrees, 10 degrees for every second that they uh, insert uh, nitrogen, in. and that may vary depending on you know whatever they. Start. But your primary way of chilling it is with ice. The primary way of chilling it is with ice. And over on the, we'll walk around to the back side, yeah. they actually have an ice plant uh -huh. that they're making, they're making ice, ice right here. And they're putting ice right into the middle. And all this power is coming through generator power? You're not on the grid on all this? Or? We're not on the grid wow. at all. It's all generator power. Wow. Okay, big, big generators like that right there. Yeah. No, more like big generators like this truck and trailer rig right here. There's a couple of these size generators here at the structural concrete plant. And that's true throughout the entire Oroville construction project is all run off of generator power. Now time to check out the world's largest uh, snow cone machine located right here in this large building. So it doesn't stay, you know, it doesn't get... Oh, that's nice. Oh, yeah, that's nice and cool. So you got a bit of water in there moving that ice around. Yeah, the snow. world's biggest ice machine. Yeah, the biggest snow cone machine. Man. Just snow <laughs> Why is all this so important? Well, structural concrete is that concrete that's going to be poured in these farms along with rebar. This is going to provide the final finish to the spillway, the toughest part of the spillway. Here you can see the structural concrete forms on the left side of the lower spillway, rock bolted down to leveling concrete and bolted all the way down to bedrock. Green epoxy primed rebar is used in the bottom of the spillway where it's wettest and unprimed rebar is used in the structural concrete training walls. Time to head down to the secant cutoff wall but first we'll look at a few things along the emergency spillway on our way down. Right underneath us, there's a little fissure that was kind of creeping up right over there, and uh, we were afraid that that was what was, uh, you know, we're going to get up, yeah, get get up down, down there. So a lot of people think it was over here, but this is not what was failing. That was not the big point no. of concern right there, it was right back where we just were. Right. They spin around on us. And that, that, all that material, like cement material, that's RCC? Was, right here? Yeah. No, no, that's just regular concrete that comes out of a, your your standard mix design from uh, from and around. That's all the part local. Of the emergency. So was that poured after the fact? 
Yeah, that was poured after, and so we were uh, we didn't know what what the rest of the winter was going to bring, so okay. we we stopped. This is that fissure right here that was creeping up, yeah. and it was about underneath this road right up here. So this, and this is where concerned. we had a problem. Now. Yeah, the whole reason for the evacuation. We thought it was going to drop a problem. I was going to go go right through here, but you know we've since covered part of that stuff over. So on our way back through here, can we stop and just get a quick photo of that? Uh huh. Remember the big helicopter rock drop last February? Well, those rocks are still there right now, but they will eventually be removed and replaced with roller compacted concrete next season. Here's mass, the helicopter bags. Yeah, mass filled with concrete, sand, aggregates, whatever they could fi find to just basically pile into those rocks during the emergency. There, yeah, you can see the original erosion. Wow. And so we threw those in here as fast as we could. This, so, this area didn't have any truck access, so the only thing we could use was helicopters to get it over here right after, you know, those first couple days afterward. What's the plan for these bags now? Uh, I would presume that this would just all be removed. Yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll fill in this whole area with RCC. Okay. So all of this is going to be uh, cement next year. Uh -huh. Down to the. Uh, There's the old the access tunnel. to the spillway. Yep, that's the old boat ramp access. Welcome to the Oroville Dam Emergency Spillway. This is the first time I ever got to see firsthand the erosion. This is the erosion from the emergency spillway, and it is a big, deep canyon. But it won't be here forever. When you witness the level of this erosion on the emergency spillway firsthand for the first time, you realize how close we came to a real disaster here at Oroville. We really dodged a bullet. Now let's go check out progress on the secant cutoff wall below the emergency spillway. One, two, three, four big old drill rigs. Yep, this big boy on the front's the BG-50. This is where they put the secant past the camp final. Mm-hmm. Three more generators. In previous updates, we learned about secant wall construction from this short video from Piling Contractors of Australia. Secant pile walls are used to construct in-ground retaining walls. Because these piles are cut into each other, they form a continuous wall, which can reduce water inflow into the excavation in front of the wall, as well as retaining the soil behind the wall. First, a shallow guide wall has to be built. This guide wall is shaped to locate the piles to tight tolerances, ensuring that the overcut from one pile into another is as required by the wall design. The guide wall is constructed from reinforced concrete. Often polystyrene or timber void formers are used to obtain the scalloped shape of the inner face of the guide walls. Once the guide wall has developed sufficient strength, the piles are constructed through it. The wall can be made from alternating soft and hard piles, in which case the soft pile is usually unreinforced. The name secant, because the walls are cut into each other as opposed to tangent right next to each other. Here's how the construction of the secant wall is going on at Oroville to date with some interesting new details. The spillway we had up there is uh, 732 feet um, away from, from the secant pile wall and it's parallel. Uh, the secant pile wall is actually an underground cutoff wall. It's going to be a reinforced concrete wall that's drilled. Uh, they're drilled shafts and they actually overlap each other or they're secanted over the top of each other. And so it makes a continuous wall. So there's about 125 drill shafts or so. There's uh, 110 sections. Each section has five there you go. Uh, shafts. Um, in the series of five, they're three foot in diameter with a one foot overlap. Uh, your two ends in your middle are uh, not enforced, reinforced, so there's no steel in it. Right. And your uh, second and, and fourth one is reinforced with steel. Gotcha. And between each set, there's a one foot gap. 
feet. Oh, uh, there was 1,800 feet down. So the theory the is between. Yeah, but what's the theory on that? Well, the theory is if they're for relief drainage, if they need it like, to go through the gap. Yeah. Uh, okay. You don't want to create a hydraulic oh, issue. Oh yeah. Ground. You just blow the whole thing out instead of blowing the whole thing out. Yeah. 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 Inevitably, water seeps through the ground up here. If you drill a hole anywhere out here, you're going to find water at some depth. Right. And uh, with a lake above us, also that potentially could, you know, feed that hydraulic, you know, conductivity underneath the water or underneath the, uh, the ground here. But uh, the idea here is that if water, if we have to use the emergency spillway ever again, we hope we never have to. Um, but if we do, this this would be the the point where uh, we would stop any headward erosion. So the water would come down over the emergency spillway. There'll be roller compacted concrete what we call a splash pad from in between the two structures. Once you get down to the sea camp pile wall, there'll just be a little taper off the edge and the water will roll off here and hit the natural topography again. So what we don't want to happen is we don't want that undercutting to start going back towards our structure and potentially failing the structure. So this creates a cutoff for that water to have any headward erosion. And, and I want to, you want to clarify something. I mentioned on one of my videos that I thought it was an oversight that there was this uh, <laughs> collision between the uh, rigs and the power lines, but that's not the case. You all, everybody knew that that was going to be a problem and it's part of the schedule, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah that's part of the schedule. Uh, they're getting real close to having the permanent reroute of the mm -hmm. power lines done. We actually have a meeting next week to mm -hmm. discuss coordination between Kiwit and the power line group. Once we reroute the power lines, I think at the end of September, we're scheduled to pull the shoe fly lines out so they can continue the forest end of the power. Because the whole idea of this sea camp power, sea camp wall is to uh, get it done around December, January time frame. I think we have a finished date right now scheduled for the end of December. End of December. All right, good. End yeah, of December. Did you say how deep the go is going around? The deepest, the deepest drills are about 65 feet. They've, they're, some of these holes might go a little bit, you know, plus or minus. The goal is to embed those uh, those shafts at least 10 to 15 feet into the bedrock down at the bottom. And so we actually need this big guy right here. This is the BG50 drill, and it's a hammer drill. I think Tom was about to start talking about this before, but it actually is. Uh, what, what we're doing is we're pre-drilling with these lighter lighter duty ones through the so the softer soils, but then once we get down to that really hard base, you know, bedrock. This guy's a hammer drill, and he, he can pound through that rock pretty quickly. He vibrates as it's actually uh, pounding the uh, and, and the rotating head at the bottom. And how deep do you typically go into the bedrock with this guy? 10 to 15 10 feet. 10 to 15 feet. All right, good. That's the goal. Yep. So is it going to go through basically that hill right over there? Or it's going to run up close to it. So the hill that you're seeing all the way on the other side is actually, <laughs> that's the, the other side of the spillway. Oh, you yeah, right. The, you can see the wall there on the Where corner. Where the cars are trucks. So it's going to go a little bit, um, it's going to go right up through that parking lot. I think it's going to stop right around there, right up. Right. right up near the edge of the other uh, spillway. Yeah. Where are the power The Seacant Cutoff Wall is a very important new addition to the Oroville Dam complex and will prevent erosion from ever threatening the emergency spillway if the emergency spillway is ever used again. you can see right there so stay tuned for part three of our amazing tour of the construction to date at the Oroville spillway as we drive down and check out the huge concrete structural training walls in the main spillway thanks again for your continued support of this station and subscribing remember to hit the little bell if you want to get these updates as soon as they become available See you here.